So we are expanding our membership, the Society at TFD, over to Patreon. If you are already a member on YouTube, you don't need to move over, it's not going anywhere. We're just expanding to Patreon with a few additional perks. We have two tiers where you can contribute at a seven or $12 level. You'll get ad-free bonus content, office hours with me, access to our book club, our community on Discord, where you can chat about money and other things, plus everything you see listed here. It's important for us as a company to be a self-sustaining machine so that we can continue to cover the topics that are important to us and speak candidly about the things that matter, and supporting us on Patreon is one way to help us do that. You're not just supporting us, you're also getting tons of awesome perks as well. So click the link in our description to join us on Patreon. They were only going to offer you more or a bonus if you said something. And I was like, aren't you happy you said something? And I was like, yes, yeah. you said something. Hi, my name is Naya. I'm a software engineer living in Brooklyn, New York. I make $150,000 a year. Yeah. And you're 26. <laughs> and I'm 26. Just turned 26. <laughs> Birthday girl. Yep. Hi, my name is Casey, and I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I make $77,500 a year, and I am a mechanical engineer at an engineering consulting firm. Oh, and, and I'm 26, too. Do you have any debt? Yes, a lot. <laughs> I... <laughs> I have student loan debt. I have now a mortgage, which is the new one to think about every single day. I graduated with $120,000 in student loan debt. I am now at $77,000 and I graduated three years ago. So um, that was, uh, and not having like interest being raised. Oh, nothing. I have no interest on, on my loans. I paid off all of the interest on my loans and paid off some loans along the way. So. That is where I am right now. So I also have a lot of debt. Um, student loans, uh, that's that's where all my debt is right now. I don't have a mortgage yet, you know, fingers crossed soon. Yay debt. Um, and I'd say I have more debt than you um, with student loans. I uh, I have chipped away at it. Um, I have about 15K down. Um, and fingers crossed that the student debt cancellation goes through. That would be another 20K for me. Mm -hmm. That would be great. And um, yeah, that's all the debt I have. That's my answer. Okay. How much do you pay for rent? Is it listed average or high for your area? I pay 1600 in rent. And it's actually a good deal for my area. My landlord was very generous. Actually, I live in a house, well, I guess a row home, townhouse, whatever you call that. Um, I, I rent the whole thing. Um, it's three bedrooms, one and a half bathrooms uh, for 1600 a month. Is that how much you pay, like total rent or how much your share is? Um, that's total rent. I've been living alone for a couple months now and my soon to be roommate is coming in this, this month actually. And so I will be paying 800, he will be paying 800 as well. Cool, yes. so lucky. For myself, I recently bought a house um, in East Flatbush. I was able to buy that house for $645,000. And before then, I was living in an apartment in Brooklyn. It was for $2,500 that was being split between my boyfriend and myself. And yeah, getting into this house buying process, it's, it's been a lot. And continuously continuing to learn the ropes, um, it's been a lot. <laughs> The monthly payment right now, they did like the mortgage, interest, and PMI. Yeah. That's all 4500 So I just put like, let's budget for $5,000 a month because I am unsure what the utilities are going to cost just because we're not paying utilities yet. Uh, it's a lot more than I was hoping for, like especially knowing people before when they were saying like they were able to buy houses and mortgage was like equal to their rent or less than. Um, I went in at a time where I was like, that's just not. I mean, it's also New York, you know. I know, but it's like, it just going in like, that's just not going to be the reality for me since yeah. the rent originally that I had was twenty five fifty. And talking to my neighbors, um, my neighbors actually told me that I got COVID prices, which was wild at the time because I thought like, we were trying to find apartments for 2500 for our rent. And it was very hard to find what we wanted. So to find out that our building was more expensive and they dropped the price because of COVID, I was like, oh, we wouldn't have even been able to oh, afford this at some point. So I didn't know that. Yeah, but um, very grateful I'm able to afford the house now. And 
Um, my mom's very proud of me. Yeah. Well, my family and friends are really proud of me. Yeah, we're all proud of you. Yeah. I'm so proud. How do you know each other, and how did we meet? Okay, so we know each other from high school. We met freshman year. Um, Casey transferred in a little bit later, but at the time I was volunteering in the library and I was told that there's a new person working in the library and I was just like, oh, I want to meet who's a new person and there's Casey. So I'm like loading books up in the stacks, I think, like out in the, in the, in the back, it's like really quiet and dusty. And suddenly this really bouncy cheerleader comes in with her, with her sweatshirt and everything, like repping the high school. You got one, you had, I remember distinctly, you had one earbud in and the other one was dangling out and I could hear the music like fully. Yeah. It was also really quiet in the stack. So it's easy to hear. And you're like, Hey, my name's Naya. Who are you? And I'm like, Whoa, this is a strong ass personality. You were a shining beacon in this darkness stacks. and in the stacks <laughs> and also just in the darkness that was transferring high school when you're like 14, 15, it sucks. <laughs> so you were, you were wonderful. And yeah, so Fast forward 10 and a half years later, here we are. I like that question. That was an easy question. <laughs> My next question for you. How did you negotiate your current salary? Is it at, above, below market rates? So in terms of negotiating, um, yeah, I mean, I had a bit of a, a, like, I already had some experience with the company before I actually came to the salary conversation. Um, I was an intern there for six months. And then I worked part time there for another six months until I graduated college. And that is when um, we did the salary conversation negotiation. Um, he gave me a number. I said confidently, yet also shaking on the other side of the Zoom call um, that uh, I think I'm worth a little bit more than that. Um, but uh, realistically, what I what I said was that, you know, I have been performing at um, an above average level, I believe. Um, and I just, you know, got to the point and I wasn't aggressive about it. It just kind of matter of factly. And um, and I believe I you know, should be earning a little bit more than this. And he said, you know, I'm glad that you asked that because I can offer you, I can offer you more. And, you know, you just have to ask the question because usually they are ready to play that game and negotiate those numbers. So um, he was able to give me a higher number and I was happy with that. So I think, is that the answer? <laughs> and I just want to add in that she did text me when this happened. She was like, so you did. She <laughs> texted me when this happened and she was like, yeah, because you told me how they said they were only going to offer you more or a bonus if you said something. And I was like, aren't you happy you said something? And I was like, yes, because yeah. you said something. Honestly, yeah, because I was shaking beforehand. I'm like, I can't do this. I don't deserve more. But I also felt like I deserve more because I pulled all-nighters for that company and I was an intern. But anyway, sorry, getting a little emotional. But um, yeah, so, okay, now you answer. Okay, Um, the answer is no, I did not. So when I first got hired in to my company, I was told, we were told beforehand like what the range was gonna be. And I think we were told um, it's gonna be, I think they said around like 90,000 to 110,000. So when I got, when I actually was, when I actually was told I was gonna be making $110,000, I felt, well, there's nothing I really can negotiate because that's the higher end of the range. And I'm very like grateful that they were willing to give me the higher end of the range. I was in my senior year of college when COVID happened. So having friends who all their um, all their interviews stopped because of COVID, I just kept thinking to myself, I'm very happy I have a job. But then I also felt very like, oh my gosh, what if I don't have that job? Like, I don't know what's going on. And that was pretty scary. And there was no follow-up. So there was a point where I did message my manager saying like, hey, just making sure like, Still expecting me in August 2020. We good to go. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm just happy that it all worked out for me. So that's really all I can say. Do you have any savings or investments? And what is your best savings strategy? Got it. So I do have savings and investments. And um, it has changed over the years. And it has changed a lot, especially since I just bought a house. So that changed a lot when it came to my savings. But um my first strategy when I graduated college was to get an emergency fund. So that wasn't something I really thought about when I was in college because at the time I was thinking about money that I needed during school and money that I needed for the summers. Um, when I graduated, I kept hearing about the whole have an emergency fund and I wanted to have like a certain amount. So I know the first goal was like three months 
six months, 12 months, and do that much, but I wanted to get an emergency fund. Um, I did set up like the retirement funds. I had a Roth IRA at some point, but I stopped doing the Roth IRA just because um, I get really high taxes in New York. So I just thought I'm just gonna max out um, my other investments. And in terms of savings, like my other bucket for sa- other buckets that I have for savings, besides like the emergency fund and investment retirement, I do have a savings that's very separate, again, for vacations, because I know I travel a lot and I want to make sure whatever visits I do, whatever countries I want to visit, that I have a budget for that and I stick to that budget. Question. Yes. When you say like separate buckets, are you just saying like, your just general Excel sheet budgeting or mental budgeting, or is it like you have savings accounts dedicated to these? I have a savings. So I have like a high yield saving account. That's my emergency fund. And then I have like another account where it's like, that's for vacationing. I also have an emergency fund for my two dogs because even though I do have insurance for them, um, sometimes things are out of pocket Mm -hmm. and I just want to make sure that they're fine. And um, I had a fund for like house and car. So before it's, was when I was like trying to save up for a house or like if there were things I needed to fix like in the apartment or fix my car, I had that in a separate um, account as well. So it's just easier for me to just have all that money come up my come out my paycheck so that I know like that safeguard of seeing a number there and then whatever goes into my checking, I know I can spend. So that's how I break apart my uh, savings and investments. I don't have a fund specifically for my pets because they are also newer acquisitions. Um, (laughs) My cat that I was fostering for a year, I foster failed, which means I adopted her. For those of you who don't know, people sometimes cringe when they hear that. Um, And then the puppy I just got. So I haven't done that yet, but that's something I definitely want to work on. Um, In terms of strategies, my dad had always told me it's smart to have at least a $10,000 cushion in your account at any time for emergencies. So that's really my baseline for um, emergency fund, I guess, since you were mentioning that, is having 10,000 in my account at all times. Um, And then anything uh, in addition to that that's in my account, I can use as I please. I obviously have some objectives for the future. I mean, I have savings plans. I have a certain breakdown that I try to aim for each month in terms of budgeting. I actually use the Mint app which is like, yeah, yeah, no, we talked about this. That's right. We both use it. So I use the Mint app, which is associated with like Intuit, like TurboTax Mm -hmm. and all them QuickBooks, I think all three of those things. But, um, and Mint, I like have very specifically, like very, you know, down to the last dollar, like really, um, budgeted for the various categories. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I try to be realistic, you know, like you can be ambitious and try to save as much as you can, but in reality, you're going to have to spend a good amount on groceries every month and all that. Um, and then I have, you know, I don't want to spend more than a third of my monthly income on rent. That's just, you know, something that we hear, right? And that's that's another thing I, I go by. Um, and and I try to put, um, ideally, at least a third into savings. Um, things have definitely been in flux lately because, I mean, like for you, I'm sure you've already mentioned it's in flux for you because you bought the house. I haven't bought a house, but I just... I did have to move from my last place to my new place and then I got the puppy and that that is expensive. Puppies yeah. are expensive. But I think also <laughs> just yeah. being like aware that things are just flexible and that's what the yes. savings and cushions are for, just for that flexibility. So, yeah. so um, okay, this question says, how do you handle feelings of professional envy? So I, I have never felt, I don't know, I guess there's usually admiration before envy because envy is a waste of an emotion. It's just kind of sucks the soul out of you. Um, like I'll take you as an example. I feel like this is a good question for us because our our uh, salaries are drastically different. Mm-hmm. I have never felt envious of you, I've, but that also could just that could have to do more so with your personality because you are the well, you are like the most genuine person I know, and you're very humble. And I've always only felt excited to hear about your successes. So I, when it comes to you, I've seen, I've, I have thought like, wow, you know, that's a lot of money. Or like when you got your first raise and you told me about that and like, you've never been shy to share like, like numbers with me and everything, which I appreciate because again, those conversations like this (laughs) are really important to have. And I, I've only ever thought, wow, that's like, that's a lot of money. That's amazing. You know, like, how did you get to where you, you know, how did you get to where you got? And like, you know, I, I acknowledge like, oh, you know, she's got a different industry and this is what she's doing. This is the company she works at. And I find it, if anything, educational before, you know, bitter, because mm-hmm. I know a lot of people do feel better and there's just nothing to gain from that. So I have 
only ever just it's been it's been kind of a motivation to strike up conversations with the people who do make more instead of feel, being envious it's like hey how did you get where you are like yeah. can, can we talk about this because i because i for some reason i have like no mechanical engineering friends even though i'm a mechanical engineer all my friends are like computer software and like programming and stuff and they all make like very big like high salaries like you because that industry the industry is just it's booming I'm like why didn't I study that college but um I I really appreciate it though because all my my other friends that you know you've met in Philly they're also very open about talking about this stuff and it's great because we literally will sit and we'll strategize together it's like Mm -hmm. hey I took I got this certification and it helped me with this and like oh cool how much did it cost you or you know what's the website so anyway a bit of a long-winded answer but um I think you handle it just by being, think about instead of like, you know, being bitter about something, what can you do to be more like the individual that you're envying or something, you know, um, strike, a, strike up a conversation. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. This, it was, I feel like that sounds cliche, but just. I think a strike up a conversation is a good thing because I feel, um, I watch a lot of YouTube and I no but you mentioning that like the strategizing I feel me watching like certain like like um interviews or certain channels of people talking about how long they've been in industry or how much they're making it sort of gave me it gave me expectations of what it is I could work up to but it also told me like okay like these are different roles that I might be interested in that I didn't know before whether it's um because this question also made me think about like role envy, like maybe what the responsibilities are or what is it that I see myself trying to do. And I feel like, yeah, talking to different people, I have talked to others who have told me like, say, if I wanted to switch into like university recruiting, that is something that seems really cool and I can see myself being really good at it. And I love the idea of helping to get students find their place in tech particularly because that's what really helped me get into tech. And I understand that that would be a pay cut, but I've heard people say it's like the most fulfilling role that they had. So it's not something that I don't want to pay cut right now in my life, but it's something that I think about in the future. So I do think those conversations do help, but I also understand like even for me, my salary is really high, but I'll have people who might have started a year, let's say, after me who are making more. I don't feel envious towards them, but it does give me insight to um, maybe like the um, type of companies, the cultures of those companies, what is the work-life balance? And that's been a huge thing for me about work-life balance. Yeah. I'm not super envious if you do not have a work-life balance, but you're making so much more money than me. Um it's still cool to know, especially if it's like something you're really passionate about and some of those roles. But um, I do. I love the conversation about like, yeah, how did you get to where you are? Like, how did you make this happen for yourself? And um, then sharing that information to other people. I feel like you've literally done that with me, you know, and I've like you've given me different career advice and asked me for my resume, which I have not given you yet because <laughs> I want it to look better and I'm trying to finish my certification but yes I I mean like those I I'm glad I have you to talk about these things and my other friends in Philly because yeah I am what are your long-term career goals because I I study mechanical engineering and my industry um you want to get licensed so uh i'm taking my fe exam first which is the fundamentals of engineering exam so that will certify me as an engineer in training officially and then after that i can take my pe which will be my professional engineering exam uh, and that will get that will make me a licensed engineer officially so looking forward to that i definitely want to do that before i do any shifting um if i decided to go to down the management pathway um uh, I would want to finish developing my technical um, expertise and certifications, get that license. So I'm very excited about that. So um, yes, my my company will give a um, $1,000 as like a little pat on the back for getting your FE certification. Um, and for your PE, that's pretty much an expected prerequisite to um, getting, you know, 
I, I yeah, to getting a promotion beyond the position I'm at right now. So down the line, if I wanted to become a senior chief engineer, or if I wanted to be project manager level three, like within my company um, specifically, I would be expected to have a PE. So I'd want, they would want me to be a licensed engineer. What comes with that is that I would sign documents and, uh, and more official. I would, I'd have a stamp. We call it a dongle, I think. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, it's like on a flash drive or something, like, because now everything's digital. So um, used to have a, you know, print everything out and send it to the client, these huge rolls of drawings for your buildings. But yeah, anyway, I'll have a dongle. I'll be, I'll be an engineer one day. I'm an engineer now, but like I'll be licensed in yeah. the future. What about you? So I have a hard time being someone who like tries to plan everything super far out. And I think it was a it was a big transition for me going from college to being a worker where with college, you're every year, you know what to expect. You need a grade, you need to pass versus being a worker. It's like, yeah, how do I what is the level I want to get to and why? And in terms of me being a software engineer right now, I have been very motivated to get to that next level just because um, I'm a software engineer one. I really want to see myself as a software engineer two. It is a that's a short term goal, but I want to feel like I set this goal out for myself and I'm able to reach it. And I want to then be able to see like I can have ownership on my team. Like I want my manager to know that if he needs me to be more responsible or to trust more things in me that he has the confidence in me and I have that confidence in myself. So that's been a, but probably my largest goal is just having that confidence in myself because I know I do a good job and my manager lets me know it. My team does tell me it. And You're amazing. <laughs> Your friends tell you. But it's, I, I, I want to... I want to be that point person that people can come to for help within my team or sister teams, whatever the case may be. Um, sometimes I call it like a subject matter expert. I think for me, it would be really cool to know that like I have gotten to this point of I have this like product or this tool that I'm working on and I have put in that work and put in that depth of knowledge um, to be that point person for a bit of time. And I think it's I think at the end of the day, I like to see myself as a resource to people. So those are all short term goals, but I have questioned, like, do I want to see myself as a manager in the sense of like being able to help people like guide and help people along their careers, being able to strategize. I find I love hearing conversations around strategy, but also I find a lot of what managers do is being able to be a resource being able to teach and I love that I love the mentoring I love advising um I used to think for a really long time that I wanted to be a teacher uh I originally wanted to go to thinking about that (laughs) I originally wanted to go to school for teaching and my mom was like um she was like um why don't you go to school for a skill and you can teach that skill when you're ready and that was the greatest thing for her to tell me because that's exactly what happened. I went to school for computer engineer, sorry, for computer engineering. And I have been a teacher's assistant. I have volunteered in high schools. I have volunteered at like um, Black Girls Code. I volunteer at STEM for Dance, like different things that involve like people coming in and teaching students to get introduced into technology. And that is like my bread and butter. I love, (laughs) I love doing stuff like that. And but I don't know if that means I see myself like going into like the department of education, like being a teacher or maybe transitioning to a part where I just have that impact with like students or youth to get them more involved. Um, I think one of my greatest resources is sharing the knowledge that I have. And I think I am really good at it. I think I I love when my the teachers that I work with now tell me like, oh, they love how I explain to students because it just makes me feel like, oh, my God, I actually am I'm good at this. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, it's like I I always tell myself like for me to be get to the point of being a teacher, I want to feel very secure in my knowledge as an engineer. Like I want to feel secure in the work that I've done before I am trying to then teach it. And um that to me is probably like my biggest career goal is just that security and i know what i know i know what i put all my like time and effort into and i want to then bring in the next people to innovate and make it better um 
because yeah, I'm probably not gonna do this forever. <laughs> but um, that's the stuff that like I really. This is what really I'm talking enjoy. about. She's so genuine and humble Thanks. and caring. Sorry, it's just yeah. I I loved listening to that. <laughs> okay, what's the biggest financial secret of your industry? I don't know if this is really a secret, but um, I always got the question of like, like, would I get my master's in being? I've asked a, you that so many times. You have like being a software <laughs> engineer. Would I get my master's? And personally speaking, I felt like other engineering disciplines. I see the point of getting a master's to get ahead and to grow. But I felt for a lot of the software engineers that I met, so many people were able to get ahead because of being self-taught. Um, products that they worked on, connecting and networking with other engineers in their company to learn and to grow. And I feel like even though me going to college, like I would not have been a software engineer and learn to code if I did not study computer engineering when I went to school, I can see why that was good for me, but may not be the route everyone takes to get into technology. And if you dedicate your time to understanding, like really understanding the field that you're going into, like the work practices, the workflow, and looking at the interviews as a mixture of personality, but also taking a test, that mesh can get you to the door. Um, It might be hard without a degree or it might be hard without the experience, but you have to know how to sell what it is that your skill set is and be genuine of this is what I know, this is what I don't know, and how you back that up. And I don't think you need, I don't think you fully need like a degree to say that you know how to be a software engineer. I think there are multiple ways and projects I can do that for. Um, But it's... It helped me get through the door, but not everyone gets the door. And for those who are trying to transition into software engineering, there are so many programs out there to help that. But um, understanding like the rigor, the workflow and all that and doing it to change careers and understanding like it's going to be a lot of upfront work until you feel comfortable. And you may never feel comfortable because you're always learning. Technology is always changing. And um, sometimes the work can seem easier than you expect. And sometimes it can be really difficult and you just need that practice, that muscle memory of getting through the project. So uh, that might have been a long-winded way to explain it, but <laughs> try it. You did great. I Well, I think it's, it's funny because I don't think of these as secrets, but I do think they are important. Um, just certifications and um, licenses. Like I, in my previous answer, I had talked about, you know, I'm going to be getting my license so I can advance further in my industry. Um, a license carries a lot of weight in my industry. And um, I mean, and I think that can be said about a lot of different industries is that certifications and showing that you've gone out of your way to um, stand out in, you know, a certain skill set um, and that you're an expert in something. Um, that goes a long way, I think, you know, on your resume and such. And when you're bringing yourself to a possible employer. Um, And I also think the other secret is networking, networking, networking. Um, I just think who you know can really help you advance because I know that I think we've all experienced putting our resume into the black hole of the internet on some job post somewhere and you're wondering, oh, what am I going to hear back? And you never do. And things like that. I think networking just is really critical for um, for, you know, career development, um, and also just finding positions that you may want. And I just want to add organizations can be very helpful. Um, I also, I was part of the National Society of Black Engineers and without them, I would not have gotten my first internship because that career fair truly helped me my freshman year of college. So I just, I think I remember that. Yes. But I I just want to say like, there, there are a lot of support and resources and you shouldn't feel like there isn't a way to get in, but you have to do the work to for getting into the places. Yeah. Thank you for doing this with me. Thanks for having (laughs) me, Naya. I, I'm very happy to be here and there is nobody else I would rather talk about finances with than you, my best friend. And, uh, and I can't wait to see you at dinner after this. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Bye. Goodbye. (laughs) 